It's a pleasure to be here, to welcome everyone in person and connecting online. Um, welcoming also Professor Filippo Sbrana, who will offer the lecture, The Economic Consequences of the Ukraine War, Past and Present. Filippo Sbrana is Assistant Professor of Economic History at the University of, for Foreigners of Perugia in Italy. He is the author of three books and about 20 articles and contributions to collective books as well as the editor of two special numbers of scientific journals. Filippo Sbrana is also a member of the community of Sant'Egidio, an international community that uh, has its foundations in prayer, battle against poverty, and work for peace. All donations that are collected within the Rongo Baghetti community this month, both in the form of monetary contributions and medical donations, will be devolved to Sant'Egidio's efforts in Ukraine. Please join me in welcoming Professor Filippo Sbrana. Thank you, Filippo, for being here. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. First of all, I wanna thank Notre Dame University for the invitation for this lecture, in particular, Dr. Silvia Dall'Olio. And um, I'm, I also want to thank who want to co cooperate with Sant'Egidio community to help uh, Ukraine in this very difficult time. Uh, at the end of my speech, uh, we will listen for some minutes uh, uh, Elizabeth Boyle. She's graduated in, the, in this university and she's a member of Sant'Egidio community and uh, uh, she deals uh, specifically with Ukraine. And so we, we, we listen something about the work uh, uh, that Sant'Egidio is doing uh, at this time. So the title of the lecture is The Economic Consequences of the Ukraine War. And uh, first of all, uh, English is not my mother tongue, so I apologize for the mistakes I will do. Um, on the 24th of February, 2022, we know everybody that Russia launched a military offensive in Ukraine. And the war has returned to Europe. It is not the first time after the Second World War, there was the Balkan conflict at the end of the last century, but the, for the first time, a great nuclear power is directly involved in a war in Europe, Russia. And this fact caused great concern. I think all over the world, in every state, also in the United States. In the recent weeks, there has been talk of a possible nuclear war. Nuclear war. It hadn't been talked about for many years. This tells us that there is a great risk we are all taking. And I think for this, the war in Ukraine affects everyone, not only Ukrainians, not only Europeans, but everyone. And of course, the most important consequences of the war are many people killed, thousands of injured, and a huge humanitarian crisis. Millions of people have been displaced. But among the consequences, there is also the impact of the war on the economies of the world war. Ukraine, Russia, Europe, the world war. And it is the topic we focus on today. I'll show you a brief summary of our meeting today. At the first, I will say something about the last two crises of the world economy in 2008-9 and in 2020. This because I think it's important that we have clear which is the frame, the point from which we move. And so the impact of the war to the world economy after two crises, this is the third one in a short time. Then we talk about the consequences of the war. So refugees, damage to the Ukraine economy, something about Russia, and what is happening in the war economy? So uh, inflation, GDP, employment. And then we'll say something about what can happen tomorrow. 
So we start with some information about the past, about the global economic crisis of 2008. Uh, we come, we are here after 15 years of troubles in the world economy. 2008, 2009, the banks had, to, I, I say something very simple, of course, we have not a long time. So the banks has provided many loans to families which they used to buy houses. But the real estate sector went in crisis, and then also the banking sector. In the fall of 2008, the US government let the Lehman Brothers Bank fail, confidence among traders collapsed, and the global crisis began. A very strong econ economic crisis arrived. This is important because for 80 years, production activity has not decreased so quickly since the 30s of the past century, the, 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 big, the, the, the very important, the, the crisis of 1929 that I think everybody knows. So 2008, 2009, we can see the slide, we have a great recession. I'm sorry because this uh, table is in Italian, but uh, I had it in, in, in my book, but uh, I think you can understand is real GDP growth rates. So you see different countries, also European Union, uh, Stati Uniti, United States, Japan, and so on. And you can see in different years till today, 2021 is not completely correct because it was an estimation, but it's about 0, 0,1, 0, 0,2 point. So we, we had great recession, high unemployment, and in the war, the end of the crisis was quite rapid. It already arrived in 2010, but in Europe, it continues until 2014, due to the problem of the high debt of some countries, some states, the so-called sovereign debt crisis. It's possible you remember the problem of the Greek. Uh, they had a, a, a big uh, uh, debt. The, they didn't communicate the, the, the right information, and so the crisis was very, very large. The spread, which is the difference between the interest rate paid by different government bonds, the spread went up, and the management of the public debt, debt became difficult. So it was also difficult to make an economic policy for development. And in those years, we had millions, millions of new um, unemployed people. And it was a very difficult time. Uh, uh, who lives, who live in Italy, remember that, uh, for example, something very sad is that many entrepreneurs, uh, they killed themselves because of the crisis, because they couldn't pay the salary, they couldn't support their own family. And so it's very sad, but they committed suicide. And as I said, there were millions of unemployed. So it was a very sad time, and it was not a long time ago. Okay, you, you can see 2009, every country's the GDP go down of three, four, five. United States, 2.8, but in general, uh, Japan, 5.5, and so on. The second major global recession is linked to the pandemic. We know everybody that in March 2020, COVID has already spread to many countries all over the world. Lockdown measures were taken in some countries, in many countries, and production was suspended. Everybody stayed at home and production, a big part of the production was suspended. And as we all know, it was not easy to deal with the pandemic. There have been several waves and variants of virus, Delta, Omicron, and so on. So the GDP of the world has decreased of 3%. You can see 
in the in the picture in the table. In USA, 3.5. In Japan, 4.8. In European Union, about six. In some countries, they have even more. In Italy, you see 8.9. It was a very big shock, which affected all countries. And there was a united reaction from all economic policy authorities, from governments and central bank. Monetary policy at the time was very expensive everywhere. At the, in the final of 2020, and especially in 2021, also thanks to vaccinations, the product started to grow again. It was only partially held back by the successive waves of pandemic. In 2021, Italian GDP grew more than 6%, the European one by more than 5%. The estimates for 2022 were very optimistic. There was a lot of hope of a new time. Italian growth, we are in Italy, so I tell you something also about this count. Growth, Italian growth was estimated by very high, about 4.5. So two years of an important growth and European growth equal to 4% and so other countries. But everything changed with the war. This is a very big problem. Because uh, the countries most affected by the recession due to COVID are unable to recover what had lost in 2020 due to the consequences of the war, which we will explain shortly. So this is the framework. This is the context in which we must analyze the consequences of the war in Ukraine. The war is facing today current economic difficult after 15 years marked by two economic crises, a situation not easy. So about our time today, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a major humanitarian crisis affecting millions of people and the major economic shock of uncertain duration and magnitude. The, for, the first point, of course, is refugees. Today, Europe is facing its biggest refugees crisis since the Second World War, the biggest one. More than four million people have fled Ukraine and more then 7 million Ukrainians are internally displaced since the beginning of the war. The population is about 44 million. So we have more than 11 people not in their house. According to UN, United Nations, in the past week, in some of past weeks, every second that passes, a Ukrainian child becomes a refugee every second. You can imagine the time. This flow is much greater than asylum seekers in the past year, even at the height of the Syrian refugee crisis in 2015-2016. You can see this next slide. You see. In the left side, the number of refugees, and in the blue, you see the past, you see uh, 2015, 2016 from Syria, but you can see what happened in March 2022, is the red column. And in the, in the right, you see uh, the number of, of Ukrainian refugees per host country. So you see a very big number in Poland, of course, neighbor country, but also you can see Romania, Moldova, and so on. Refugees have mostly gone to a small number of neighboring countries. 
looking after the refugees from UK Ukraine, we require spending on social and housing assistance, food provision, medical assistance, and child care and schooling. The inflow of millions of refugees could result, the estimation in the first year, is a cost of at least 0.25% of European GDP, GDP, sorry, 0.25%, and much more in the major host economies. The initial costs are manageable for the European Union as a whole, but difficult to support and deliver by individual neighboring countries. You can imagine Poland with that number of refugees. I would like to underline two points, two emphasis. The first one is that it is very important that these neighboring countries will receive support. We receive support for their work on behalf of refugees, Poland, Romania, Moldavia, and so on. The second is that what is happening, I think, can help Europeans to understand better the tragedy of refugees, of those fleeing war. This is not as been the past, the, the case in the past. For example, faced with the war in Syria, Europe has not always welcomed refugees, in part did, in part didn't. We have uh, left them in Turkey or Lebanon. At the time, we didn't understand, I think, what war meant. Houses destroyed, civilians killed, hunger. You can't live there. Now, in Europe, we see every day in our newspaper, we meet people in our country. We, we, we listen to what uh, people who work in restaurants or in bars tell us about their relatives, their family. And so I think in Europe, we are understanding. We have seen closely, and this can make us be more supportive, I would say more human. Now, about the Ukrainian economy. As we can everybody imagine, a serious recession is coming to Ukraine, even if the war we land soon, as we hope. The Ukrainian economy may contract by 2015% this year, 2022. So the, the half of the GDP. Why? Because key infra infrastructure, railway links, road networks, bridges, and many other things have been damaged or destroyed. Energy infrastructure is also partially damaged with the many areas in the country cut off from electricity supply. Planting and export of agricultural commodities, very important in, the clown, in that country, including wheat, corn, sunflower oil, face significant uncertainty. A large share of the current outward migration may become permanent or remain outside for a long time, with the, um, an increasing in the labor shortages and undermining long run economic performance. Bilateral and multilateral financial support to Ukraine has been strong with the strong assistance from United States, European Union, but also International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. But of course, it is not enough. As I said, the Ukrainian economy may contract by 20%, 50% in 2022, and the inflation likely exceeding 30% in 2022. The Ukrainians' ability to meet 
its significant debt service servicing obligation for 2022-2023 is questionable. And the country may also face the choice, the choice between external debt repayment and reconstruction efforts. About Russia. I say something, of course, also about Russia, because it's the world's 11th largest economy. And since the beginning of the war, virtually all developed countries have introduced very large economic sanctions against the Russian Federation. I tell you the most important sanction. Several important banks have been disconnected from the sweet interbank messaging system. Today, they can't communicate with other financial institutions, so they can't work outside the Russia. Consequently, Russian external trade, very important the external trade, will face, is facing and will face significant hardest even in trading not embargoed products because they have no way to pay. Then other sanctions, sanctions have been blocking of import and export of some strategic goods. Many multinational companies have left Russia. The United States and the United Kingdom have decided to ban imports of Russian oil and natural gas. And th this measure will be effective at the end of this year. Many countries have closed their airspace to Russian airlines. A move that was reciprocated by the Russia. Last but not least, the United States and the a number of other countries have frozen a large share of the Russian central bank's foreign exchange reserves, about half of over $640 billion. This fact has limited the ability of Russian authorities to mitigate the consequences of economic sanction. Transaction with the Central Bank, Bank, Ministry of Finance, and National Wealth Fund of the Russian Federation are being limited. The estimation for 2022 for Russian GDP is to decrease from 10 to 15%. Now, there is a, one crucial, crucial fact, one crucial point. Sanctions have weakened Russia, but Europe in particular needs its gas and oil, especially Germany and Italy. Is it possible that you listen something about the, the North Stream uh, um, oil the, is the way that Germany is building to bring the, the, the oil and the gas directly in their country. The, the Gulf Stream uh, in Germany and the, in Europe, there was a, a big discussion about this. Only in March, Europe paid Russia 1 billion euros per day. 1 billion euros. And now I don't know exactly the, the change between euros and dollar, but you, you can have an idea. And Russia uses this money, of course, to pay its army in Ukraine. If the European Union decides not to buy more in Russia, the economic consequences for Russia will be really difficult. Otherwise, Russia will have problems but we can say not a very serious one. And I think we, we can do a political underline. 
for several years, there has been a, a conflict, not a military conflict, but a conflict between Europe and Russia over Ukraine for several reasons. Because uh, Ukraine moves away from Russia, it wants to bind itself to Europe for the Russian occupation of Crimea and Donbass. You can see here, Crimea is in the south and Donbass, uh, we are talking about, we are listing many things about Donbass in this day, is this the red area. So uh, many discussion, many conflicts, conflicts, but despite this, despite this, European countries have continued to buy gas and oil from Russia every day, every day. And this is a strange choice. We can say an incomprehensible choice. The Russian war on Ukraine today is paid for by Europe, in particular by Germany and Italy. And this is a, a serious political mistake. Now, about the global economy, we, we say something, we said something about uh, Ukraine, about Russia, now about the global economy. The consequences of the war, of course, go behind Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it's interesting to know that the direct role in the global economy of Russia and Ukraine is small, only about 2% of global GDP, and the similar proportion of total global trade, so only 2%. But Russia and Ukraine have an important influence on the global econom economy. This is via their role as major suppliers in a number of commodity markets. The magnitude of the economic impact on the conflict is highly uncertain and will depend in part on the duration of the war and the policy responses. But for sure, the war will result in a near term drag on global growth and strong inflationary pressure. The global growth could be reduced by over one percentage point and the global inflation raised by close to and a half percentage points in the first full year after the start of the conflict. You can see here uh, the impact on GDP on the left side and the inflation in the right side. And so we see that, of course, the, the European area is uh, about uh, uh, 1.3, the impact of uh, in GDP, the negative impact. We see United States is near 1% in the war is something more 1%. But you see the in the right side, the inflation is more and in the time can be very, very dangerous. Inflation, I say something about the inflation, I, I suppose that you know, but it can be useful to explain something is the rate of increase in the price over a given period of time. Inflation is not always a bad news. A little bit is actually quite healthy for economy, but only a little bit. When it increases a lot, it is a serious problem. For example, in some European countries, in Italy, where we are now, gas bills quickly become very high, very, very high. And this is a serious problem, for example, for low-income people. They have serious problems to, to, for paying these bills. And their consumption goes down, so the demand goes down, and so does the economy. Because when you have this strong inflection, 
the, there is no more the, the right equilibrium in the economy. And, and so many uh, problems start about businesses, enterprises. Business see the price of key inputs, such as oil or gas, rise. We can see here about energy prices that are rising with the war. You can see the, the last period, uh, oil, gas, coal, no? is different in different areas of the world, but here in Europe, you can see that the, the rise is very high. Businesses see the price of key inputs, such as oil or gas, rise. And uh, they may want to pass this cost on consumers, but they may be limited in their ability to do so. As a result, they may have to reduce production, increasing also supply chain problems, because we know that now the production is made by chain all over the world. And so if someone uh, don't products is a problem for all the chain, all the world. So because of this inflation, the production decreases. And the, if the costs of the inputs become too high, their production become, becomes too expensive. Nobody buys and the companies go bankrupt. And this is the crisis. You start with a part, then another, then another, then you have a big crisis. All this reduce the GDP, the wealth produced. Russia and Ukraine together account for about 30% of global export of weight, 20% of corn, mineral fertilizer, natural gas, and about 10% for oil. And in addition, this is very important, supply chains around the world, many supply chains around the world, are dependent on exports of some metals from Russia and Ukraine, for example, palladium, nickel, uranium, what we have in our mobile phones, no? to build the mobile phones, you need some of these specific metals. And you can see this uh, commodity price very, very surged. And so in uh, nickel fertilizer, you can see, and so prices are increasing. And we can also underline that the prices of many of these commodities have increased sharply since the onset of the war, even in absence of any significant disruption of production or export volumes. Because the point is what we wait for the future, and so prices surge. A complete cessation of wheat exports from Russia and Ukraine would result in serious sh shortages in many emerging markets and developing economies. There would be an acute risk, not only of economic crisis in some countries, but also humanitarian disasters with a sharp increase in poverty and hunger. This is all over the world, in the Middle East, in Africa, in many countries, because you know that with the globalization, we are, all countries are linked. You must consider, for example, that in many economies in the Middle East, with imports from Russia and Ukraine represent about 75 of total imports of wheat. So as I said, the global growth could be reduced by over one percentage point, the global, all over the world. 
and the global inflation could raise by close to 0.5 per percentage points. You, you saw the slide before and you can see again. The impact of the shocks differs across regions with the European economies collectively being the hardest hit, particularly those that have a common border with either Russia or Ukraine. And this reflects greater gas price rises in Europe than in other parts of the world and the relative strength of business and energy linkages with the Russia prior to the conflict, as we said. Advanced economy in Asia Pacific region and the Americas have weaker trade and investment links with Russia, and some are also commodity producers. But growth is still hit by weaker global demand and the impact of higher prices on household incomes and spending. And in the emerging markets economies, higher food and energy prices also push up inflation more than in advanced economies. So poor countries, they should have more problems. Something about the monetary policy. Monetary policy, policy reacts to the upturn in inflation around the world, in which way, of course, raising interest rates. Interest rates raised by a little over one percentage point in the major advanced economies and one and a half percentage point in the major emerging markets economy. And this is not a good news. The rise in interest rates contribute to slowing economic growth after COVID, because it means that uh, if you need money, if you are a, 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 a business, if you are a family and you want to buy something, you want to invest something, you want to buy a house or so on, it costs more. And so you decide to wait, for example. And if you wait, the, the, the growth goes slow. And so if inflation continues to rise, interest rates will rise again, and this will further decrease growth. So something in conclusion. In general, the impacts of the Ukrainian war will be extensive. We must know from reduced energy and food supplies to increase in prices and poverty, all of which will hamper the post-pandemic recovery around the world. And the entire global economy will feel the effects of the crisis through slower growth. And growth means many things, but means uh, uh, work, uh, activities, opportunities, and so on. We will have uh, trade disruption and steeper inflection, harming especially the poorest and the most vulnerable. Although the Russian and Ukrainian economy accounts, we said, for only around 2% of the global GDP, the consequences of this conflict will extend far behind its border and the region through energy and commodity price shocks, disruption in global supply chain, challenges for food security, a very big refugee crisis, and elevated geopolitical tension. You must consider that the increased military spending, I think many states are increasing military spendings, will divert 
funds from social needs. Disruption in maritime shipping and the in air traffic, including passenger flights, will likely undermine international trade. And so the situation is not so good. I repeat what I said a little bit ago. There have been two global economic crises in the past 50 years. And in the last year, the economy has started to grow again. But now, unfortunately, this recovery is being slowed down by the war. And maybe it could stop. So I think we need peace, not war. We need peace also for the economy. The risk is not immediate, but some economies could also move toward stagflation. Stagflation is a strange term, is the combination of economic stagnation with the zero growth, with a strong inflection, about 10%. Because generally, when you have growth, you have inflection. If you don't have growth, you don't have inflection. But stagflation is a very difficult situation because you don't have growth and you have a lot of inflation. Stagflation leads to very high unemployment rates and the rise in poverty, and also difficulties in economic and monetary policies. In short, there is the risk of a very difficult situation in various countries. About Europe, in 2020, Europe made a great development plan after COVID, after the pandemic. The next generation EU with a potential value of 715 billion euros in total. It's not like, uh, I suppose that, you know, the Roosevelt New Deal, no, very famous Roosevelt New Deal, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority and so on. It's not the same, but it's similar, okay? Money, a lot of money to be used to give subsides and loans to the countries most affected by the COVID. These millions of euros is now using, in particular in Italy, for the PNRR, the Recovery and Resilience Plan, a big plan to grow the economy after the COVID. But the war risk, risks undermining this great European plan. And it is a huge risk because the PNRR is a unique opportunity for Italy, but also each different countries, each one has its own plan. And so the situation is very dangerous. The war risks wasting it. So the, the last point is, but do we have any hope for the future? Because I think that the situation is, is not so full of hope. I think that we can hope for positive change. Change is possible. I think that the pandemic has changed, we know everybody, our lifestyle, consumption habits, work patterns, and so on. Today, we need to rethink our development model to define a new one. Also, the Pope asked for it, and he is doing is doing it with the economy of Francesco project. We must focus more on sustainability. It's very important, economic, but also social sustainability. So reducing poverty and environmental sustainability. We said Russia provides today over 40% of European natural, natural gas imports. Well, change the energy supply in Europe is possible, not in short term, of course, but it's possible, in the middle term is possible. Why don't we accelerate the ecological transition? Today is the time. 
we, we are in Rome now, and, and you see that there is a, a, a strong sun today, okay? In Italy, Italy could entirely replace the energy that arrives from Russia in two or three years with the re renewable energies, wind and photovoltaic energy, because we have a lot of sun here. There are already requests made to the states by Italian producers to build the new plants. The problem now is giving permission, but I think it's time to do it. Let's do it now. In Italy, inflation has reached 7%, very high, and almost everything depends on energy costs, increased by about 50% due to increase in gas and oil. Well, with the ecological transition, we can solve several important problems together. The environment, health, household and business budget, and make an important geopolitical choice. We must therefore invest in the ecological tra transition and make it faster. Now we can, now it's good to do it. The last point, last, but I think the most important, the peace. We need the peace. Now we talked a lot about economy, but I think the most important point is that we need peace. War has many negative consequences. Consequences: dead, wounded, refugees, and many negative economic elements for Ukraine and for all over the world. The first. The most important answer is peace. We hope that many will work towards this goal and that the peace will come soon because peace is the real solution. And I think that in this Eastern week, after celebrating the Palm Sunday, we can also ask to the Lord for peace to come soon. So, Thank you for your attention. And so now I'm happy to invite here Elizabeth Boyle. Uh, as we said before, she, she's uh, involved in the activity of Sant'Egidio community, in particular for Ukraine. She, She's working in the International Relationships Office. She works for the peace, so a very important work. And now she's helping also the Ukraine. So I think that Elizabeth is very interesting if you want to, to tell us, to tell everybody something about this war. I think you can come. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Hello, and thanks everyone for, for coming. And it was so great to hear a bit more about the economic intricacies. That's something definitely I don't know too much about. But as you said, it goes hand in hand with the peace work. So Santa Gidio is a, a community. It's a lay association of the Catholic Church. It's not an NGO. It's not an international organization. It's comprised of people who pray and work for peace in their local communities. So it was started by a group of high school students in Rome in the late 1960s who went to the peripheries of Rome to be mentors and friends with young children who really nobody cared about, who were left on the complete outskirts. And since then, it's grown into a community of over 80,000 people in 73 countries around the world. So sometimes you don't hear the name of Sant'Egidio as much as larger groups like Caritas or World Food Program, but because it's a group that's really locally rooted in each community. So it takes a different shape depending on where it is. And in terms of Ukraine, the community has been based there since 1991. So it's a over 30 years old community made of around a thousand plus members. When the bombing and shelling started in Ukraine in February, a few of our members began to leave, 
we've now seen that a lot of them have returned back. We have members in Kyiv, Lviv, Ivano-Frankivsk, and Kharkiv. The most folks have left Kharkiv now because it's so close to the Donbas region. But what's incredible is that the members of the community in Ukraine have either decided to stay or decided to return so that they can continue to serve the poor. So the reports that we get is in between the, sign, the sounds of air raids that are happening daily in Ukraine, the members of Santa Gidio are leaving the train stations below to run out and to serve the poor. There's daily food distributions to the homeless. They're delivering medical supplies, those supplies that you're collecting here at Notre Dame and elsewhere, to the elderly who can't leave their homes, to the disabled who are in institutions. But then also within Ukraine, Santa Gidio has been making sure that we can get people who are in specifically uh, elderly homes and disabled centers into different parts of the country where there's less shelling and less bombing. In addition to that, we've been able to evacuate over 70 dialysis patients to different areas throughout Italy. So using buses to help them travel from Ukraine into Italy and they're being placed with families throughout the country. It's a wide variety of services that are going on right now, but it's really very locally rooted. And one of the problems we see in Ukraine is that some of the larger groups like World Food Program can't have as much access into the country. It's very difficult to get in. But groups like Sant'Egidio have been there for years and are able to provide access to some of these larger organizations. So there's a partnership going on right now between Sant'Egidio and the World Food Program to deliver food vouchers for families in Lviv and ivano frankivsk in particular to ensure that they can receive, receive food and medical supplies and what they need. So everything that you're collecting here will go directly on buses from Rome to the communities in Ukraine and then will be dispersed throughout the country. Santa Gidio is also present in Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. So they're taking in refugees in all of those areas, assisting them with legal assistance, housing, medical assistance, food, and are also doing the same when we have people who arrive here in Rome. So it's, we could say, an all hands on deck approach from Santa Gidio. The communities around the world are really engaged in financially supporting the efforts in Ukraine, but also spiritually in prayers for peace, in manifestations for peace. There have been flash mobs for peace here in Rome organized by the youth movement of Santa Gidio, and those are continuing throughout the world. So it's, it's a great way to, on all fronts, try to disarm the militarization that we see surrounding this war with the understanding that war is the mother of all poverty, as the, the founder of the community, Andrea Riccardi says and working in global community to support the most vulnerable in, in these times. So quick, a quick overview of some of the Santa Gidio efforts. So. so I think then now if someone want to interact with us to, to ask information or to know something more, uh, we are ready. <laughs> And here, about in these days, we ask your support in particular about Ukraine for medicines, because uh, you can imagine the situation of the country. So medicines are very, very important. And you have a, a list in the website of university. And of course, also economic donation that we can use in, in different ways. So, uh, who, who will help us, I think that we thank you from now and uh, it's very, very useful. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm an art historian, so really my approach, and you may know nothing about it, but very interesting, so thank you for coming. I was just wondering how more we can read on the newspaper China and India are proving Russia and of course helping more under the economic point of view. Couldn't that somehow comp compensate Europe? Uh, yeah, the, the point of the, of course, there is a, 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 a geopolitical frame that is uh, uh, about all over the world because uh, you know that. Uh, in the past, there was a very important role of the United States of, of the NATO. Now something is changing. And uh, uh, China in this time is an important alliance for, for the Russia. You know? but, uh, 
I think that the, 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 there are discussions about this, uh, but uh, mm, China in this time is a, a, an alliance of the Russia, but uh, th they have a different approach because they are interest to peace because they, they uh, have a, a lot of trade. So they prefer to have the peace because they want to improve the, the trade all over the world. So um, what some analysts say about the future that will be uh, more cooperation between uh, in particular Russia and China, but uh, 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 is not sure that this new alliance will be a perfect alliance. So th this, uh, is about uh, political interest, economic, uh, uh, international trade, and so on. But uh, is not sure that this alliance will be so so strong because uh, it, today they 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 go in the same direction, but in the future is not sure. So uh, it's uh, how can we say it's uh, we, we wait to see. It's not nothing is sure. I think we've been asked to repeat the question. So that is essentially the role of China and in India, potential role of these two countries, um, given the current situation. My question has to do with the sanctions that you mentioned before. Um, and I understand that like in history of international relations, there is a very clear definition of, and Russia has very clearly stated what would be considered military attacks. But of course, some of the sanctions have, well, we'll have to see if they prove, you know, viable and effective, but certainly they seem um, not so far from an actual act of war, it, given the effects that they have. Do you have an opinion on this? I mean, is this a new, a new scenario of the use of the economics or economy in general, economical measures for um, within a military space, in a way, essentially, with effects on on um, decisions and effects of of a, of a war. Uh, well, I, I think that the, the the we must remember the beginning of the war. No, we we saw the invasion of a country, a sovereign country that was there was an invasion, and so of course. Uh, the, the, the sanctions, uh, it's uh, a message and not only a message to say you're wrong, you can't do it, no? Because uh, uh, you, you have, I think, three chances in front of you. You can say, okay, do what you want. You can say you can't, and so I start a war now, but we said it's a nuclear war, so it's very dangerous. And you can say, I, I send you a message, no, a, a, and I, I try to put you, Russia, in the situation of uh, decide to stop. No, you, you started, but uh, with the sanction, uh, I, I try to, uh, how can I say, I, I try to, to put you um, to stop before. Okay, so. Um, in, in our time, in our global war, uh, economic uh, and political affairs are very strongly linked. In particular, if you think to uh, international trade, uh, it's a very important link because uh, what we say about the import of the gas, now uh, in Europe, we import a lot of gas and, and this is a link because <laughs> we have this link between e Italy and Russia now. But if you think to the President Trump in the United States, uh, during the period of some troubles with the China, the President Trump said, okay, now we, we reduce the trade because we don't want to cooperate. So I, I think that... Uh, that um, from United States and Europe and other countries, 
uh, there is now a message to Russia. I, I think it's not uh, a military fact. Uh, it's like to say, I disagree with you. I, I strongly disagree with you. You are doing a big mistake. I, I work to, to, to change the situation. I work to, in the way that you stop the war now. But uh, I think that uh, also from Russia, the, they, they understand this situation also because we know that uh, uh, Ukraine is a country uh, with the many relationships with uh, Europe, with the United States. Uh, no, so I, I think that uh, in the idea of uh, of the President Putin, uh, it was that uh, after the Afghanistan, when the the, the uh, Western armies went away, it was like a signal. To, to say we don't want to go boot on the ground where there is a war all over the world. So uh, after that, it was, for example, one very good Italian journalist, he said, we risk to have a war in Ukraine now after going away from Afghanistan. So the message uh, should be this. And sanctions is another message to say stop. And if you don't stop, we work to put you in a very difficult situation, but not in a military way. So uh, the risk is that when you are in this situation, you, you can have something that happened suddenly, a problem, something that you, you can... Uh, uh, Come si dice che ti può sfuggire, diciamo, che succede all'improvviso, something that happened suddenly, and there is the risk of, of, of the war, and now it is very, very dangerous because, as we said, the, the Russia is a, a nuclear power, so the situation is all, always full of risk because uh, uh, there is a war with uh, one very <laughs> dangerous country. So, we hope uh, to have very soon peace for Ukraine, but I think that for all over the world, for not only for economic reasons, but for, also for uh, security reasons, it is good if this war stops. Okay, there is a question from a person online um, who says the reconstruction of Ukraine will require a massive effort. Would it be would not be smart to get Ukraine into the European Union as soon as possible? Does the reconstruction of West German cities after World War II offer useful lessons for rebuilding the destroyed Ukrainian cities? Interesting questions. <laughs> Uh, the, about the, 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 the link of Ukraine with the European Union, I think it's something very delicate. It's very, how we can see, because now the, the, the Ukraine is, in, is uh, not in the middle, but we can say in the middle between Russia and Europe. And one of the reasons of the... Uh, when President Putin uh, uh, said that we start the war, one of the reasons was the, the link between the Ukraine and the NATO, not with the European Union, but the, the, the NATO. Uh, but the uh, uh, European Union is very linked with the NATO, and uh, there is uh, uh, an article that says that if someone goes against a country of European Union, the other must have to support this one. So um, I think that in a short time to uh, think the entrance of Europe of uh, Ukrainian in the European Union or in the NATO or in the European Union is very dangerous in this time. So uh, in the future, it should be possible and interesting. I think that uh, now we have 
um, three points. The first one is stop the war. The second one is rebuild the country and help the, the refugees and help the country to, to start a new life. At the, in the future, we will think uh, uh, this political alliance, but in this time also for what uh, Silvia Dallolio was saying before, um, we, we, we have to put a lot of attention in giving messages, political messages to Russia that uh, uh, in this time is better not to do it. I think about the, the economic future of Ukraine, I think that uh, uh, they will receive a lot of money. Uh, because uh, um, many uh, organizations, countries, and so they will help uh, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and so on, will help the country. And so their uh, uh, GDP restart in a very short time. The first point is finish, stop the war. The, the war is the point, and to finish the war, in, is the first point. Also, we can say we have a problem of justice. It's true. But first of all, we have to stop the war. Then we will think to every other problem. If you stop the war, the first thing the If we stop the war, the, the country we restart a new life, they can rebuild, they can help uh, refugees to, to come back in the country. And so th this is, will be very important. About uh, the, the Germany, it's an interesting question. I, I never thought about that. I think that the, the history of Germany after the Second World War, not about the city, but about the country, was an interest, interesting story. Because you know that uh, after the Second World War, the, the, the Nazis, Germany, was the, the big enemy of all the world. They did many mistakes, many terrible things with Hitler. And uh, what the United States and other countries did was to uh, support this country, first of all, to, to start a new time, to rebuild and to take a time to build something new. So I think that uh, in this time, um, Ukraine is in the middle of uh, uh, military, political, and many troubles. I think they have to stop this, to restart, to rebuild, and in the future, step by step, to return in, how can I say, normal situation. And in the future, we will think, they will think about uh, alliance, new, new situation with the European Union and so on. But I think we need time after a war. New, you need some time to rebuild, to rethink, to, to, to change the mind, and then we will build the future.